Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on November 17th for Be All In for Kansas Kids biweekly webinar. I am Debbie Deer, and I'm joined by my webinar planning colleague, Hannah McGahey, and we both work for the Kansas Children's Cabinet and are happy to have you here with us today. Our agenda for today will be to share general updates um, from the All In for Kansas Kids system and opportunities that are available to you throughout the Kansas Early Childhood Network. And please note that each of these informational slides now includes in the caption at the bottom of the slide, how that information ties back to the All In for Kansas Kids strategic plan goals and strategies, which we are always trying to be mindful of. Um, for our program today, the team from DCF is with us again to continue sharing uh, part two of a more in-depth look at the pandemic uh, federal relief funding efforts in Kansas through the Child Care Development Fund and Coronavirus Relief and Recovery Appropriations Act monies. And then to end our webinar, we will also have the team from our Tomorrow's Story Bank here to conduct a new mini sense-making session with us. We continue to share with you about the Early Childhood Workforce Advisory Group, who is conducting their 2021 Annual Workforce Needs Assessment Survey. And so your responses to this year's survey are needed and will be used to determine the training needs and interests of child care providers in Kansas. So this survey is available to everyone who works in an early childhood setting, providing care to children zero to 12 years old. And so we invite you to complete the survey through November 21st. Please contact Casido at this email provided with any questions that you might have. And also to note that I did put all of these links that I'm referring to in the chat prior to starting the meeting. The ABC Early Childhood Initiative brought their evidence-based attachment and behavioral catch-up, which is referred to as ABC intervention, to five sites in Kansas from May to April, from May 17, 2017 to April 2020. 36 families in 36 counties were screened for toxic stress, and the exciting snapshot results from this three-year project show that a 10-week home visiting program for caregivers of infants and toddlers does result in a healthier Kansas. So the results include a full evaluation report from KU and an executive summary. And so these are available at the links provided in the chat. We continue to remind you of the free trainings on the ASQ or Ages and Stages questionnaire, which are still available on a couple more dates in November and December, uh, one of them is tomorrow from one to four, which is highlighted in red here. Um, the early identification of delays identified through these screenings will allow children and families to receive services as soon as the delay is recognized. So find more event and registration details on the TASN website uh, listed in the chat and participants for these can also earn KDHE clock hours. Kansas Power of the Positive invites workplaces to be allies in strengthening Kansas families and protecting Kansas children with their Family Friendly Workplaces campaign. So if you are an employer interested in learning more, you can contact the Kansas Children's Service League, or there is also a link in the chat for employees to access the survey to participate in. Please help support them in these efforts to strengthen uh, the recruitment and retention and productivity in these Kansas workplaces. The Family Servant Service and Guidance Center offers programs and presentations designed to make raising children and teens less stressful. So this sounds like very good information for many of us to know. On November 28th from 6.30 to 7.30, a presentation uh, called Discipline Strategies That Actually Work With Kids will be available. And if you are interested in attending this, we will have a registration link available soon. Please watch the All In For Kansas Kids weekly emails for this information as it becomes available. 
And to sign up to receive these weekly emails, if you haven't already, um, you can go to a link at the Kansas Children's uh, Cabinet.org, hashtag sign up. We continue to remind you of the availability of a mental health mobile crisis helpline, and this is available as an additional support for eligible Kansans in need during a crisis. Services are uh, for all Kansans 20 years old or younger, um, any, including anyone in foster care or formerly in foster care, but it's not limited to those in foster care. And so there are over-the-phone supports, in-person supports with a mobile crisis response and um, many options in emergency situations. And so this number listed here um, can be accessed by all Kansans and is not limited to professionals of any kind. The Kansas Racial Equity Collaboration, which we heard from last webinar on some information, they want to make sure that they share uh, that they are offering some virtual lectures and debriefs in 2022. Um, these are happening, the first one on January 26th, uh, and that is called Debunking Myths Around Racial Inequities in Child Welfare. And so there is a reg registration link that we have provided for that. And as well as on February 23rd, the topic is forward movement shifting from control of to support for black and brown families. And there is also a registration link for that. COVID-19 vaccination resources are now available for families of young children. On November 2nd, US health officials and the FDA joined together to recommend these vac vaccinations for children ages five to 11, along with an announcement from Kansas Governor Laura Kelly at that same time. Resource links um, are in the chat and they include information on the CDC vaccinations for children and teens. Also, you can, uh, they can help you find COVID-19 vaccines by zip code or manufacturer or Kansas COVID-19 vaccine information from uh, KDHE. Open enrollment for the marketplace healthcare coverage started on November 1st. So the Administration for Children and Families or ACF is working to help the early childhood workforce access coverage during this open enrollment period. Be sure to register at the link available in the chat to attend the December 3rd Early Childhood Stakeholders Group meeting where the Kansas Health Navigators team will present on local guidance and assistance to be able to access this open enrollment opportunity. And so you will also find links in the chat for the ACF information pertaining to this subject as well. The Early Childhood Recommendations Panel is scheduled to meet this Friday on November 19th from 9 to 11.30 in the morning, and you can watch that live on YouTube at the Kansas Children's Cabinet website. The panel always welcomes individuals and organizations to share your thoughts and concerns, either written or verbal, during our Kansans Open Forum comment section at each meeting, and you are welcome to submit those to me by the day before the meetings at five o'clock and uh, my email is in the chat for your reference. And uh, this week's meeting, will um, we will be hearing an overview of the Build Back Better plan by Dan Worry, who is from the Hunt Institute. And he will be um, presenting and discussing on what Kansas can begin doing now to prepare for this and how to engage stakeholders as well as uh, finding common language and messaging to use um, to convey this information and key decisions to make. So a discussion and feedback session will take place with panel members after his presentation. And then in hour two of the meeting, we will have our regular current work groups meet um, um, like they have been for the last few months. The Early Childhood Block Grants and Preschool Pilot Grants are now available and the application process started on November 1st and goes through December 20th. The Kansas Department of Education and the Kansas Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund um, have announced the release of these funding opportunities 
And the purpose of this grant is to provide early childhood services for Kansas children and families ages birth to kindergarten entry, as well as services for prenatal and family supports. Applicants will submit a single grant proposal as outlined in the RFP, and that will be done um, through the Kansas Common App platform. And I have shared a link in the chat to the Kansas Children's Cabinet website where you can find all of the information needed to apply as well as resources for technical assistance. Um, the Kansas pilot, Preschool Pilot and ECBG are intended to provide su supplemental funding to fill gaps. And so programs applying for this grant must demonstrate that they are investing other available financial resources and community support into their programs before requesting this funding. That ends our general updates and announcements section. And now um, I welcome Michelle Allen and Megan Smith back to continue sharing pandemic relief funding efforts with us. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks for having us today again. Uh, my name again, I think we're getting familiar, but my name is Michelle Allen and I'm the CCDF Pandemic Relief Project Manager. Um, I am with the Kansas Department for Children and Families. Give me just one second to get reorganized here. Okay, so a couple weeks ago during our presentation, um, we shared information around our spending plan specific to the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. Um, and today we're kind of going to shift gears a little bit and cover uh, the second half of, of the pot of money that we have. Um, before I dive into information around that, I just wanted to, again, provide a little bit of context around the Child Care Development Fund um, and also the different uses, priorities, things like that of uh, the American Rescue Plan. So CCDF, uh, the primary goal overall is to improve access to higher quality care for lower income children. And the three broad areas of services within um, our regular CCDF spending our child care financial assistance. This is the fund that pays for child care assistance throughout the state of Kansas. Um, health and safety, meaning licensing and safety regulations for our child care facilities, and also quality improvement activities. There is a minimum amount of, of dollars that we're required to spend annually on quality related initiatives. So Megan and I report directly to our CCDF administrator for the state of Kansas, Carla, and it is her responsibility to maintain all of these relationships uh, throughout our state and ensure that these peers are all working together to really serve the children and families uh, throughout the state of Kansas. So we have a about 300 page document on available online. I can send you the link if anyone's uh, dying to read it to our state plan. Uh, that outlines how each of these individual gears uh, work together to create a comprehensive system for early childhood that's supportive of our, our children and the families that we serve. So within CCDF, uh, we are given quite a bit of flexibility on how we implement specific practices related to uh, the CCDF state plan. However, there are a few restrictions. Um, dollars within the within the child care development fund are not able to be utilized for any school tuition or any services that are duplicative of services provided during the school day for children in grades 1 through 12. Uh, we can't use it for any sectarian services, um, but we are able to allow parents to choose to send children to child care provided in church facilities. Um, and the big one is that we are unable to make any major purchases or major renovations um, to you know, build a, a new child care facility. We are able to make minor renovations related to health and safety, uh, just to make sure that, that those, like, those uh, state and local child care standards are met, including licensing and the fire marshal requirements. So just wanna give some kind of context around um, the different relief funds that we're talking about here. So we spent some time during the last meeting, um, and I'm sure that recording is up and available if anyone missed that, 
um, just discussing the CURSA Act and the, the plans for that specific fund. Today, we're primarily going to focus in on the American Rescue Plan Act discretionary funds and the stabilization funds. So those were both included in the, um, the law that was passed on March 11th of 2021. Um, and then that uh, is part of the, the big old pie that is the nearly $440 million that the state of Kansas has for relief dollars. So this is just a breakdown of um, the total American Rescue Plan Act dollars, again, signed into law on March 11th, 2021. Um, as you can see, the majority of the dollars within this fund are directly for uh, those stabilization grants. So the primary goal for that is to stabilize the childcare sector by providing financial support. It's pretty simple. So 90% of these dollars are required to be administered directly to our childcare providers as subgrants. And it's a major priority of uh, the federal government to ensure that this is done quickly, simply, and easily, and equitably. Uh, they want this money to go to our providers, and we, they don't want it to be um, complicated. And then our supplemental discretionary funds um, goals for that include expanding access to high quality child care, expanding access to child care assistance, mental health supports for our providers and for the children that our providers are serving, and then also outreach on the availability of child care assistance. And then again, allowable uses are the same as the CCDF regulations. <laughs> there aren't uh, new rules that we get to follow. They, it's the same across the board. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Megan uh, to give us a little bit more information. Yeah, good afternoon. I suppose we're afternoon now. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm Megan Smith and I'm the CCDF Program Support Specialist with DCF. Um, and so as Michelle was talking about with the American Rescue Plan, and we're kind of gearing up for some of the planning on the spending of that, we wanted to just kind of go review again the, the spending categories that we've really identified within the goals of um, CCDF and, and also the goals for um, DCF on, on how we are looking at spending and um, meeting the needs of the families and providers in, in Kansas. And so looking at those direct family supports around subsidy, um, the direct provider supports around like the, subs the sustainability grants, looking at uh, quality, promoting and recognizing it, workforce supports, and then those infrastructure or capacity building um, opportunities that we can find. And, and the spending categories, we felt are broad enough. Um, they're the same from CURSA, but we felt that they were broad enough um, to really kind of capture uh, the needs in Kansas. And so we don't have a ton planned for the ARPA funding currently. Um, and Michelle will share the timeline in a little bit as far as like that planning process. But we did want to share just a few projects that um, we already have planned and in the works uh, for or even happening currently um, using the ARPA money. So that you were well aware. So the sustainability grants, as many of you may already know, um, the round two were funded with ARPA and those closed in November. And so we'll be having payments being issued at the end of the month, which is really exciting. But then we're also gearing up um, for round three, which would begin in March of next year by trying to you know, make some shifts, make some changes, some adapting some things based on lessons learned um, and, and talking with Child Care Aware of Kansas and looking at um, how we can make that even a smoother process and more equitable um, so that everybody can access those funds. Um, another one, many of you may already know because they've talked on this webinar, is the Child Care Health Consultant Network. And using the ARPA funding, we're really excited about the opportunity to expand upon their services, um, looking at creating a more tiered approach to uh, the work, the amazing work that they're already doing, and then also adding in some startup support specifically aimed at um, 
childcare providers who are looking to become licensed, helping with some of the barriers, some of the, the costs, things like that. Um, and, and also supporting our childcare licensing surveyors through that process as well, um, however they can with those health and safety requirements. Um, so that is um, in final approval status. And that is also in partnership with, like I said, KDHE and Child Care Aware of Kansas. Um, and then something that's already in the works is cool. providing funding for background checks and licensing fees and cool. waiving that cost for um, new providers as well as current providers that are seeking renewal for their licensing fees. So very excited about that. I know um, we've gotten some positive feedback around that one. And we know that that can be a really big burden for childcare providers, the cost of that. And so um, we're working, we're doing that through, again, through KDHE and the child care licensing. Um, and so between the two presentations two weeks ago around the curse of funding and, and some of the work that's currently underway and some of the things that we're hoping to get underway soon, um, and then our ARPA planning we felt that maybe this could be a really great opportunity to tap in to this group um, to just learn a little bit more about how we're doing, right? So like, we really think that the voice of um, our partners and the community and the providers and the families is incredibly important to this process and to the work that we do. Um, and so we wanted to provide an opportunity to get some feedback and really kind of learn what's working. Like what of these things is really working? What has been most exciting? What has been most impactful? Um, and then on the other side, what hasn't worked? Um, what could we improve on? So I just kind of want to open the floor a little bit um, and uh, allow for some time for some feedback. Hey, Megan, this is Amber. How's it going? Hi, Amber. Good, how are you? Doing all right, doing all right. So I may have COVID brain on this, um, but as far as, if can you go back to your slide that had the different categories, the different buckets of support? There we go. So under direct provider, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about some of the ongoing discussions we've had around providing health care to providers, providing them with a, a pathway to receive um, state health care. And I didn't know if there were study, you know, focus groups or feedback surveys that you've received from the licensed community. Is this, is this something that you looked into, considered, maybe not? Is there a different, you know, pathway to this or could funds be used for that um, as a way to support, to help retain the workforce? So I just, I just didn't know mm -hmm. if that was a path, that was something that was discussed as an opportunity or, or did you guys even consider that? Yeah, definitely. And I would say to Amber, first of all, is that we're still very much in that planning process. And so when thinking about things that so maybe have been considered, but also we're still considering a lot of things. And I will say healthcare is one of those pieces, just benefits generally for childcare providers, some of those fringe benefits that are a little bit harder. So I would say, yes, we have looked at that and it's not off the table. It's just, it's a little bit, there's some nuances to it. And also trying to figure out the most equitable way of doing it the most sustainable way of doing it because the tricky part and that's really been a tricky part with this this, this relief funding is that this is temporary funding so how do we also plan for some of these bigger pieces so that we can sustain them as well um, because things like health insurance and just fringe benefits in general for child care providers has been a pre-pandemic uh, sort of concern um, and so, yes, that has been a topic that has been discussed um, 
we're still looking at some different solutions or ways that we can approach it. I don't know if solutions probably is the word, but other ways that we can kind of approach it and bring that in. Right. There is a question from Rich in the chat. Was, was or is it possible to use the funds to support parent cooperative arrangements for infant care as a strategy to increase the, available, uh, the availability of infant care slots? Michelle, I have you for that. Yeah, I think that that would need to be something that we would have to look into. Um, I'm, I'm going to write that down and, and try to, to think about that and get some, some answers. Yeah, I mean, I will say too, Rich, like cooperatives is, is a category that we have looked at just generally to learn a little bit more about what that what that could look like in Kansas. But I don't know that we necessarily have the answers for that yet, just because, again, with some of the parameters around the CCDF requirements is really kind of having to look at some of those pieces, um, especially things that may not currently exist under that umbrella. I'm not saying family cooperatives don't currently exist, but what it can look like um, under that umbrella a little bit more specifically. Okay, Megan, I'm gonna pose another question. So as far as workforce, under the workforce piece, um, and I know this, these are some things we've talked about, how are you guys processing, or I don't wanna say process or strategize, that's not good words, and I haven't had lunch yet, so I'm getting a little hangry brain here, but are you, how are you, have you come up with strategies to identify ways that you're getting to the areas that are not being served? And I know in, in whether it's rural, where it's urban, whether it's culture, where is, how are you guys processing that? Because I, I mean, I don't want to say good, bad, or different. I think some of the, I can speak about that, but I want to know how is, how are you guys navigating, identifying, you know, from a workforce standpoint, pay aside, you know, an example would be the pathway into the profession. You know, how, how are you going about, is there some intentionality to recruit, you know, more men, more women, more individuals of color to elevate that piece? So, you know, is that, where, where is that discussion being had? in this, because I'm just wondering, you know, if I go, you know, this presentation to a lot of my, my network and that don't speak to this high level, they may not be able to say they see this working in them. They see this work impacting them. So I guess from a PR standpoint, how are you guys in a, from an agency piece, how are you getting into those targeted areas to say, you know what, this is work that we're doing. How can we, and I know we've discussed this, you know, mm -hmm. how, how do we dig in a little bit further so that you see what's available, what, not you see, this is what's available to help the community. Who were we missing that's not at the table that's in these discussions that we can help bring folks up on, a, on a, you know, more board, on board with this to, yeah. to, to better help you all identify some some additional strategies? Yeah, I would just say, well, I'll let Michelle talk on it too, but I was gonna, I would say first and foremost, our partners, right? Like we're really leaning in with our partners, but also these different groups um, where there is a little bit more diversity in the, who is here, who has access to the webinar, but we also recognize that like this webinar, for example, not everybody is here either that we wanna reach, but we are also leaning in a little bit with our partners um, who also sort of 
play that in between, especially with providers um, and who have that closer connection and that closer relationship with them. Um, and then we've also brought on a marketing team. And I, I, I'll let Michelle talk a little bit more about the work that they're planning on doing around it. But um, I 100% Amber, and like you said, we've, we, we've had conversations about that because that is something that's really, really important to us and with this effort. Right, because I and and I and I'm glad, and I know we've we've kind of discussed this in, in different um, groups, and I and I've said this across different pieces. I think there's some opportunity there to to to. I mean, our, our partners is one, but sometimes our partners don't even know the people that we need to be talking to, and so we we may need to step back from that and say, you know outside of our partners, who else could potentially give us a pathway to this group, to a group to get that engagement? I mean, whether it's it's parents, you know, whether it's individuals, uh, you know, if, if we're trying to attract, you know, individuals into the profession, where are we going to recruit those folks? Because I'm, I'm not saying, and I'm just playing a little bit of devil's advocate here, that our partners may not know that. They, I would say Amber, there's, there's so many significant um, efforts that are being done, you know, sometimes in the dark, sometimes we don't always know about them, sometimes they're duplicative. But um, if we go back to the strategic plan, I mean, if you just look across work groups, we are all having these conversations, you know, all the, the um, meetings that I'm able to be in with you, you know, I hear you ringing this bell every time and in every group there is somebody that is ringing that bell. And so across the system, we are saying this. Um, and I, I think that, if I can speak a little bit maybe for what Megan's saying is that the, the partnerships is that these ideas are coming out of these collaboratives that already exist across the system. And since we're all working from the same blueprint, the same ideal, then those little seeds are going to work their way through those partnerships and we'll get to the ears of the people who are responsible for allocating the money. You know, obviously it's not a, per a, a perfect world. So, you know, all of our needs are not going to be met, but we have so much collaboration and we have so many um, specific groups that are doing this pointed work and asking these questions. Um, you know, one example I can think of just right off the top of my head, the, um, the career pathway work that's taking place within the system, we are specifically shopping it to providers directly. And we are scaffolding um, the awareness to the career pathway so that we can get input from people who are actually going to be using it. And that's just one example. So, I mean, I think across the system, we should pat ourselves on the back just a little bit. Um, not so much that we stop working hard, but just a little bit. Oh yeah. And and, and I, I agree, Hannah. I, you know, if there's anyone that's a proponent for planting seeds, dropping seeds, I'm, I'm definitely one of them and I can see the, that we are doing doing that work. I, I think for for me, and it's not a but, I think for me, it's how can I, you know, I'm, I'm doing that, but I'm also maybe trying to speed the process up a, a, just a little bit because I can see more in the, in, in the grassroots um, that the messaging is just not quite getting there and they're wondering if they're getting left out. And so I, I can't, I can't do that that work alone, but I want to be able to keep our groups and our networks aware so that we can be more intentional about thinking about that as we continue to to push through. Where are we missing? Where are we not, where are we missing an opportunity to 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 create a new partnership? And so, yeah. so Amber, if I could just respond to just a couple of things. So I think that one, it's really important for us to look and remember that some of our infrastructure pieces for us to really understand our workforce. We're really making intentional efforts around that as we work towards having a workforce registry that will hopefully help us to better understand our workforce and also give providers a really direct way to move into the workforce and help us track them as, as they do so. So that's one thing that I do think will be really supportive and help us to really inform a lot of those efforts. Um, but then specifically on the, the marketing and like the communications pieces and as we're working to craft messaging with our marketing team, um, right now, we're in the process of doing some persona development, um, like this week, actually. So if there are any um, 
like specific groups of providers that it would be helpful for us to have our marketing team talk with and interview, um, send me their name and their email or phone number, a good way to contact them. Um, because we would certainly love to uh, make sure that their experiences and um, their, their, their day-to-day lives are, are captured in the messaging that we're working to craft and create. Um, that, that would be so helpful. So any suggestions you have on that um, from anyone on this call, um, we want to make sure that the, the providers that we're interviewing are representative of uh, the providers throughout the state. So I'm open to any suggestions on that. Okay. Other thoughts around um, uh, around what's working, what's not working. Um, I know one thing, LaFerris, I, I saw your comment about um, social and emotional supports um, and I responded, but just in case some people are on the phone and don't have access to the chat, she was asking about um, resources and, and some supports around um, some of the increase in behaviors that, that she's seeing in, in children um, during this post-COVID, somewhat post-COVID, long-term COVID situation. Um, and, and, and that looking for some additional resources um, and support area. And I, I, that is something that we tapped uh, early in our conversations and that we sort of created a subcategory of specialized technical assistance opportunities. And one of those really being focused on mental health supports and within that, we're also looking at social and emotional supports for our providers within the classroom um, and how we can sort of elevate that because we don't know what the long-term impacts are of this of, of COVID and quarantine and all the, the new things that exist in all of our lives and the vocabulary that we use now around our lives. Um, so we we want to make sure that everybody is well equipped and that and that's been an behaviors and, and working with children has always been an ongoing topic. We know that and working with um, our partners, Child Care Aware of Kansas and, and also working with Casito and, um, and some of the work that they've done around social and emotional supports. And so we know that that's an ongoing need. Um, but with this, uh, we are looking to tap that. And we, those are part of an amendment. I saw your follow comment where you can access those resources. Hopefully they're gonna be available really soon, but I know both Child Care Aware and the R&Rs generally, as well as um, Casito, I know they have resources around that already, but we're gonna do more targeted technical assistance. Hopefully will be available soon. We just have to get through that, you know, the contracting pieces of, of that work, but we will let you know once um, those are sort of officially available. So just given time, I'm just going to advance to our next slide just to uh, ensure that we can cover just this last piece. Um, and then we can try to keep uh, discussion relatively short because I think we've covered a couple of the questions uh, that I wanted to ask already. Um, but just want to kind of share um, our, our vision for moving forward. Um, that this is kind of the, the next phase of planning. Um, and I do just want to note that all of these things are subject to change. Some of them may be advanced, like needing to be done a little bit quicker, um, but just want to, this is a starting place for us, right? So January through March, uh, we really see that being a period where um, our team at DCF is able to onboard uh, for these new agreements that are going to be signed and finished and getting in place over the next few weeks. Um, and really ramping up those phase one initiatives. Uh, simultaneously, uh, during the months of February and through April, uh, we'll begin those stakeholder engagement sessions. 
Um, this specifically is, is one area where we may be able to, to kind of start some work pretty soon um, just to, to prepare us for the next several months. Um, but then we also want to take a look at the in existing initiatives and see what worked well, what maybe didn't work, what, what uh, wasn't uh, taken up on, um, and where, where we're needing to target some additional in investments to uh, make supports more available. Again, March 1st, uh, we anticipate sustainability grants round three beginning. Um, we'll have more information as we approach that date. And then in April, we'll take all of the feedback that we collect through those stakeholder engagement sessions, assessment of our data, things like that, um, and begin developing a phase two portfolio. And then once we have that done, we want to bring it back out and ask, did we meet the mark? Are we missing something? Um, is this going to meet your needs? Because if we create something that isn't going to be utilized, we want to make sure that uh, we're kind of going back to the drawing board on that. Um, and then in early May, um, we would you know, wrap up those revisions to the portfolio and then begin a similar implementation process, phase rollout uh, to the different initiatives that we did with phase one. And again, just want to note one more time, all of this is subject to change. Likely, it would be accelerated if any changes were needing to be made. So with that, um, I think that we have maybe like five-ish minutes, Hannah, to, uh, to kind of just talk about. Um, you know, it's whatever. This has been a really productive conversation. Um, you know, it, I, I spoke with Jen, and if and if people have questions, we can talk and we can we can do it. We had planned another time; it's no big deal. Um, okay. Also, I wanted to clarify the the point that I had made in the in the chat. It's incredibly difficult. I think we need to recognize it's incredibly difficult for any state agency or any entity, any one entity, to have direct financial access to providers individually. Currently in the state of Kansas, we don't have a system that does that. So even though maybe DCF has subsidy access or um, you know, child care where has a different type of stipends and grants access, the actual physical process of giving money to individuals is something that we strive to do with the registry, but just the schematics of it are nearly impossible. And so I know that that's something I've heard quite a bit is we're very appreciative for this this ARPA money that's going to be going to provide or going to programs, um, but sometimes it doesn't always trickle down because the acute need is for the program itself, and so providers aren't actually seeing it. But right now, there just isn't an easy solution that covers the majority. So, kind of answer to my own question. Um, but yeah, you all do what you need to do, and if people have questions, let's talk. Awesome, I appreciate that, Hannah. Uh, yes. Yes, to all of that, the feasibility of individual payments is incredibly difficult, uh, but something that I don't think any of us have uh, given up on. So I think we're all still having conversations on a regular basis um, around that. So, um, so with all of this, um, what are what are you hoping to see as we move forward? We kind of talked about some planning processes and things that that we would like to do over the next several months, as far as the, the planning and kind of the, the rollout of that initiative, or those initiatives, I should say, um, what, what are all of you on the call uh, hoping to see from us um, as, we, as we move forward? And I don't have access to the chat, so if anyone types in there, if someone could help me out, that would be great. <laughs> It looks like Rich recommended um, family engagement and that I think it was January to April time period. Thank you, Rich. Well, I just wanted to add to that, that um, uh, the families that are in the process of birthing or pregnant and birthing and that will be looking for infant child care may be a group that very specifically are going to have pretty um are almost certainly going to have unmet needs <laughs> in terms of infant uh, child care and starting from just the supply side without thinking about the people who are needing the care 
and how we design the system would seem to be a missed opportunity. So just, I'm not sure how it would work, but um, I think um, keeping that in mind, um, there may be solutions that parents can come up with that providers don't. Um, Yeah, absolutely, Rich. And I think families, you know, some of the personas that Michelle was talking about earlier, families are definitely in that bucket, as well as, you know, obviously our partners and just communities, generally speaking, and, um, and providers. But I think we know that it, it's not just one group, it's really sort of, we need to try and hit it at all the different angles. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I think we we always think about the kind of the churn that occurs within the need for childcare, right? You have people who are entering it and entering the need for childcare and leaving the need for childcare constantly. So the need, uh, and they're all different ages. They may be grandparents that are caring for grandchildren. They may be, you know, family members who have never had to do this before. They may be parents who are just new to this, right? So we have so met so many diverse needs within the family population too, and the different types of supports and services that they may need to access. So, um, so I know that that is something. It's a really high priority uh, for us to to make sure that we better understand. Um, and then also, um, you know, we have uh, closed our request. Uh, for bids around the family needs and preferences study, which we're hoping will give us some insights and information around uh, the utilization of childcare assistance, both on the family side, but also on our provider side. We know that um, less than half of our providers throughout the state accept DCF childcare assistance. So we also want to better understand uh, that from both of those perspectives as well. Um. In the chat, Lisa Schmidt says, sustainable programs that build a professional workforce for the future, 100%. Um, Lisa, I do wonder if, I'm not, you can also very politely say no thank you, but I wonder if you would be able and willing to come off and talk a little bit more about what that looks like for you. All of this funding that we're discussing is a five-year term, and many of the professionals that work in work in early learning work for a year or two or three, and then they're not, unless they work for a school district, they leave. So you have the constant turn of hiring new people uh, over wage over benefits over lots of different things. Uh, Michelle spoke to the fact that for many families, it's kind of a five-year window that they're looking for early learning from the birth to the start of kindergarten. Um, there needs to be some sustainable programming that these professionals can stay and work for more than a year or two or three. I happen to be a, a, an executive director of a nonprofit and I have a preschool teacher that's been with us 20 years, she's retiring this year. Those don't exist any longer. Um, I'm going to struggle to replace her because I don't have, they're not working for a school district. They're not working 180 days a year, six hours a day with benefits and vacation. And the true cost of early learning is greater than anything you put on a piece of paper. Yeah. I really appreciate you you coming on and talking about that. And um, recruitment and retention is definitely part of the conversation. And, and I also appreciate you bringing up sustainability 
like we said, you know, these funds, we recognize these funds are temporary, but we want the solutions to be long term. I happen to work somewhere where we've done preschool since 1964. That's fantastic. Yeah. I've only been here five years, but it's changed in five years. And in another five years, it's going to change again. Mm -hmm. It's where are we going to be five years down the road and 10 years down the road, not just next year. And that piece. Oh, and no, I'm not a Head Start program for whomever asked. Um, it's the long term. Mm -hmm. Many of the families that we are discussing serving in five years haven't even thought about having a child yet. Uh, Lisa, if I can kind of speak to that a little bit. Um, this is Hannah. I work for the Kansas Children's Cabinet and Trust Fund and I am PDG funded. So I'm the workforce coordinator. Um, but really all I deal with is the PDG stuff. So separately, but concurrently with what Michelle and Megan are talking about. There are efforts in the um, all-in strategic plan and there's work that is being done that we're almost ready to, to, start, um, to start really openly talking about. But um, we are blatantly aware of not only the mass exodus of people from our workforce because of um, pay disparity across the nation, across the workforce, um, that's not unique to childcare at all. So a com compounding issue. And um, so we're, we're acutely aware of that. Um, and we have been working for the last um, seven months. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Longer than that since January. Wow. 11 months on um, a career pathway for the state of Kansas through the early childhood profession. And one of the key factors to that is stipends and pay parity efforts, legitimate pay parity efforts. Um, so we've been we've been discussing, you know, um, we've been discussing recognizing different types of providers and where they want to go in their career and if they want to stay at a certain level for for a number of years, um, why people leave. So this is work that we have been um, combing through for the last 11 months and um, we have some solutions that we're almost ready to propose. Um, hopefully we'll be um, in tandem with um, in addition to PDG and then in tandem with um, other federal funding opportunities. So there is work that's being done on that. Um, I know that doesn't probably feel very reassuring in your position, but it is being done. I appreciate that someone's addressing it. Um, it's, it's the long term. Um, who, this was a career change for me five years ago. And I look at it as who is going to be working in 20 years. If we don't, if we don't focus on our youngest, we won't have anybody to work. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that Again, being, how can we also utilize this temporary funding to make some of those bigger changes, those systematic changes? And we also recognize that we have to do that in partnership and in collaboration with the other agencies. You know, Kansas is one of the states where the early childhood efforts are sort of uh, in a variety of different buckets. Uh, but we also recognize how important and, and, and essential that collaboration and that partnership that that needs to happen in order to have that cohesive and comprehensive system that makes sense and works um, to the benefit of the child care providers, but also then the families that they serve and at the heart of all of it, right, the children that um, whose needs are needing to be met through this. To your point, Lisa, it's that at that young age and that long-term impact that early childhood has on these children and the families. Um, and so that's definitely at the forefront of our mind is again, how do we use this temporary funding to meet the current needs with the pandemic, 
but also how can we use it to build in those long-term um, sustainable uh, uh, changes that need to be made and, and how can we do that? Because again, we, we don't want it to just, pieces of it, we don't want it to just go away in two years because the funding's gone. Um, and so that's definitely something in the forefront of our mind. But I think also, Lisa, that's why the voices of the providers is so incredibly important to this process and elevating that and really um, being able to make sure that we aren't making any assumptions about those needs and that we know what those needs are directly. So I really, really appreciate you speaking up. So just before I move on, I just want to provide some space just to just to see if there's anything else that anyone is hoping that we can include and think about as we uh, can move forward with with the planning processes. Okay, Amanda always counts to 10, so I counted to 10 in my head. <laughs> Um, so our last question, and I know we only have a couple of minutes for this, so if this is something you want to drop in the chat, we can uh, grab that from, from Hannah and Debbie later. But who all needs to be a part of these engagement sessions? We've talked a little bit about families and um, the, the diverse representation within our providers. Um, I think it would be helpful uh, to, to better understand uh, where and how we can make these engagements. Um, and, and any any other information that anyone has that they're willing to share. Like Michelle said, if you guys wanna go ahead and drop those in the chat and we'll collect them and we'll get them back over to the team. I'm gonna go ahead and switch over back over to the other slide real quick while we finish up. And then I'm going to drop uh, Megan and my email in the chat, or Megan and my emails in the chat. Um, and if there's a, a thought that anyone has later, uh, we're always happy to discuss that. So thanks for having us. I appreciate it. It's a great conversation today. Thank you to everyone for sharing today and giving them the feedback that they need to keep this moving forward. And continue, uh, all of us continue to collaborate and build these relationships along the way. That's a big part of sustainability for all of this. So we didn't get to do our tomorrow's mini sense making session. So we'll come back around to that at a future webinar. Um, but I'm glad we were able to spend extra time on um, all of this important conversation. So to wrap up our meeting or our webinar for today, we just always remind you of uh, some upcoming things. I had mentioned the panel meeting is this Friday morning. And then our next bi-weekly webinar is on Wednesday, December 1st. So please always let us know if you have topics that you're interested in hearing about. And then our cabinet and stakeholder group meetings are scheduled uh, for December 3rd, the cabinet meeting in the morning from nine to noon and the stakeholder group meeting in the afternoon from 1.30 to three. And we will be hearing more about the open marketplace uh, healthcare uh, from our um, Kansas uh, early navigators team. So. All of that uh, is a wrap. And in closing, we at the Kansas Children's Cabinet and the All In for Kansas Kids team want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. And if you're traveling, please be safe. And um, also just please enjoy um, as much turkey and pumpkin pie as you can handle. So thanks everybody and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, happy Thanksgiving. Thanks.